Well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, this will be the fourth time I've shot this video. Um, the first time it was almost two hours long. That was way too long. And then uh, the other bunch of times uh, I forgot to mention stuff and they were also way too long because I was actually doing the, the taking a part of the motor or the engine um, kind of while I was doing this. And, and with me holding the phone, uh, it just didn't turn out very good. Um, and I do everything in one take. So it was literally an hour and a half of me sitting there talking and trying to take things apart and do stuff like this while holding the phone and just didn't work out really well. Uh, so anyway, video number four, hopefully this one, uh, this one's good. So I am not going to take apart the motor. It's already taken apart. As you can see, uh, we're going to go through each system. Um, if you look at the motor, this is the order that you would take it apart, you know, essentially. So here, near, 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 all these, all these, this, this. Anyway, uh, we'll get into first the build sheet. Uh, that's what that goofy thing over there is. Um, so I'll go through that and try to have it make sense because I don't think it made much sense in my other video when I was talking about it. So I'm, and I couldn't find my build sheets. Uh, I was going to show you them, but I couldn't find them. So we'll make do with what we have. Uh, which is extremely low tech stuff. So, so we'll get into that. So here's a build sheet. Yeah, I know it's a hunk of paper with some files, but pretend it's a build sheet. Um, so there's a row at the top and, and three columns. What you would be doing is, you know, let's say we were going to do in our second video uh, where we basically took apart, did our initial teardown of the actual full sled. So the top title you would put in here would be initial teardown. Then you would put each subsystem up here um, in the order that you tore it down. So the first thing we would do is remove the hood, gauge pod, and gauge clusters with wiring. That's what you'd write down there. The next thing you would, we took apart the rear, we took the, uh, the sorry, we took the clutches off. Then we took the rear, then we took the motor out, um, or the exhaust out. Then we took the motor out, and then the cooling, and whatever. So every time you take a system out, you would write it down here. So then you have essentially all your subsystems written down. You can put any rough observations in here, and then this column is for possible parts that you're going to have to buy. When you're doing the initial teardown, you can put things like, you know. Uh, you took the exhaust off, one pipe has a crack or a hole in it. Possibly need to buy another pipe. Um, notice the chassis got a crack when I took the motor out. You know, might need to have some welding done on the chassis. So you could put those big observations in there. Now when we get into things like, like the engine, so you'll come to a fresh sheet and your title will be engine. And then as you take things off, you will put down what, what you took off, any observations and what parts you might need. So let's say we took the head off. What do we see? There are some snap bolts for the coolant elbows. What do we need to do? We need to repair and or drill out the snap bolts for the coolant elbows. It looks like there's some shrapnel in the head. We need to either find a new head or repair this head and get rid of the shrapnel in the in the dome. So that's how you would that's how you'd go. So you know the next thing your cylinders. One cylinder has damaged nickel. Mag cylinder has damaged nickel. Need to get mag cylinder replated or find a good used mag cylinder, and so on and so forth. So this will all be written out by hand. Um, afterwards, you can take this whole thing and put it into an Excel spreadsheet. That way. You can then start on this column and this column, seeing like the things that need to be done and the new parts that you need, and you can start getting a tally on your costs. So you can take all your systems and subsystems, you can tally all the parts up, and then you can make another column and start to research where you can get these parts and how much they are and any options you have versus, you know, like, do I want to get OEM pipes off of eBay or do I want to get aftermarket pipes from Dynaport or whatever. Um, and you can do this for every single thing that you need. And this takes time, but it's very, very worth it. And it gives you so many, um, it gives you a good idea on your base budget. And it also gives you 
options and costs for those options, um, you know, uh, for when you might want to get to that part of your build. Um, and you can go either way with it. Uh, as well, you know, you can put in certain modifications that you want to do in here as well. So you can keep track of all that. And that's basically what your build sheet is. What your, you know, the main system you're working on, each subsystem that's broken down that makes up that main system, observations you see about those about those systems or things that need to be done, and then possible parts or tasks that have to be done to repair any damage that you see. That's it. That's what a build sheet is. Um, it can become, it can get to be 30, 40 pages, uh, depending on, on how detailed you want to be and, and how you want to lump things together. This is why I don't like to give you my build sheets because the way I break things down and the way I want to structure my information is possibly a lot different than the way you do it. And that's why it's important just to explain how it's done and then you can kind of organize it the way that makes sense to you and that you're not going to lose track. And the nice thing about it is, is, you know, you can, if you have to leave this and, and like dump this project for a month and you don't remember where the heck you are when you came back, you can go to your build sheet and go, okay, initial teardown. I already did that. Okay. Next page. Oh, did the engine already. Here's, you know, here's everything right to the end. The next page, I started the rear suspension. I only got halfway through. I'm still at the rear arm. Okay, I'll pick up there where I left off and boom, done. So that's a nice thing about it is that you can only go as far. Um, that's why you only work a one thing at a time, one system at a time. You don't start tearing the engine, the rear suspension, the front suspension, and the chassis all at the same time. You focus on one thing at a time, and then you will not lose track of where you are. Um, which gets us into the... Uh, into the into the motor. So, um, to tear down this motor, use the procedure that is in the manual, in the shop manual. Um, I don't want to give you every little, I don't want to tear down and go through every little nut and bolt, um, because that takes the challenge out of, out of it for you. Part of the fun that I had was actually, you know, having to look this information up and, and doing this stuff by myself, but I appreciated the help when I got into some jams. And so that's kind of what I want to, what I want to do for you is, is to go through and show you, you know, when you get stuck or when you're going to hit something, you know, that's most likely going to come up and how to get through it. So, so we'll start with, you've torn down your, your machine and here's what it looks like. And the first thing you take off is the head. So you work from the top down, just like the, just like the book says, um, you know, and, We'll go through it in the order that you would normally tear it down. So that'll give you a bit of a hint if, if you don't want to look at the book right away. So the first thing we're going to look at is this head. Now what's going to happen when you take this head off is you're probably going to leave this, the top and bottom, the top and bottom coolant elbows connected. So they'll stay like that because the head can come off with those still attached. What you need to do is take these off. There's two bolts um, that uh, hold the bottom one off on and two bolts that hold the top one on. Take them off. But what you're gonna run into is these top bolts will probably come out no problem. These bottom bolts might just snap on you. Um, who cares? Let them snap, do what you gotta do to like get them off. The heads might snap off. They still might, still, they still might be in there. They corrode and they stick and don't worry about it um, because I'll show you what we're going to do about that. Doesn't matter. Even if you snap the bolts off, take this thing off. There's not too, too much you have to be concerned about. I would just check this ceiling surface right here, like this, uh, this ridge that sticks up in the middle. Make sure that it's uniform. There's no, there's no missing chunks out of it. Um, and if that's good, and this thing doesn't have any holes or anything in it. I don't see why. I've never actually seen one of these things damaged. Only when somebody jams a screwdriver trying to pry it up. Um, just don't don't do that. Try to try to not pry it up with anything because you could you could possibly damage it. But don't worry about the paint. Uh, this can be refinished. This is just cosmetic. Just make sure that it is structurally okay, and that all the ridges, the ridge that goes all the way around, is there. Um, and that's about all you have to worry about. This can be cleaned up, no problem. The next part is this head. Now we'll get into, we'll do the bolts last, but the first thing you should look at is, 
you know, pop your O-rings and stuff off of here. Uh, check to make sure that there are no cracks. You're going to have your, uh, your rubber O-ring all the way around here. You can take that out. Just make sure there are no, you know, not that it's going to do anything bad, but because the O-ring seals everything, but just try to make sure there's no nicks or chips in anything here. Just make, make sure it's in good shape because while nicks and chips might not be bad, that generally tends to tell you how someone's treated this motor. And if they just jammed things in there and pride and didn't care, then as you go deeper into the motor, that can be a problem. So, so then flip her over. If your head looks like this, even if there's a little bit of black on here, it doesn't matter if it's, if everything's nice and smooth in the combustion chambers, you're golden. This is good. This is a good thing. Uh, you've got a head that's in good shape and all it needs is a little bit of emery cloth or steel wool um, and some WD-40 to polish these up a bit um, and get rid of any carbon. And then make sure that these surfaces are nice and flat and smooth all around here. That's it. That's all you really have to worry about. If you, if your head looks like that and just needs a little bit of cleaning up, uh, that is perfect. You're, you're golden. Um, if you have a lot of pits and metal that's a jag that's you know jammed in here from, from a piston letting go or detonation or whatever, uh, a lot of times you can clean that up with some, um, with a Dremel, um, and or some, you know, emery cloth and a bit of filing work. Uh, that's fine. And uh, even if you have a couple little pits in here, you can still run it. It's still fine. It will not negatively affect your performance too, too much. Um, but if it's really chewed up really hard, then you might want to think about getting a new head or bring it to a machine shop and getting them to um, rework. Now, if they rework one dome too much, they're going to have to do it on all three and then deck the head to get the proper combustion and squish. Uh, measurements but that's like pretty advanced and you bring it to a machine shop or a skidoo shop that knows what the heck they're doing so anyway the next thing is these stupid bolts that snap off um don't worry about an easy out don't worry about any of that stuff get this thing on a drill press put a quarter inch bit drill bit in and just drill these holes all the way through right down and then when you go to put it back together again get two long bolts that go all the way through from top to bottom and stick out. Um, so get two long quarter inch bolts and basically attach everything with the quarter inch bolts uh, and some washers and nuts and call it a day and then you never have to worry about that again when you take the head off. So so nothing there'll be nothing to jam up because bolts go right through. And that's the way I run it on my sled, and that solves that problem forever. And there you go. Next thing is the cylinders. Um, so the first thing you want to check with the cylinders is your Nicosil. Make sure that you have your Nicosil is in good shape. I run my finger nail through here and or a scribe through here uh, to see if it gets hung up or caught anywhere. And I would do that at different points in the cylinder and really get in there and take a good look at the Nicosil and make sure there's no chips or flaking, um, you know, anywhere. And like I would clean it up really good with some WD-40 and some shop towels, make sure it's as clean as possible before you, before you take a look. Um, you'll see, for instance, this one right at the top of the, at the, the top of the port here, right off the end of my finger. You'll see those gray streaks. That is Nicosil missing. That's that's where um, a ring let go and it basically chewed all that up. This cylinder is no good. It needs to be replated. Um, I mean, the cylinder is good, but it just needs the Nicosil needs to be replated. Um, so be really, really fussy when you're looking at that. Uh, another thing is take a look at the bottoms of... Uh, you know, the bottoms of the cylinders, uh, make sure there's no chunks missing out of here. Make sure the crank hasn't come into contact with anything. Um, look for any foreign material embedded anywhere. Uh, also, it's a good idea to rent a uh, piston bore measuring tool and, uh, and measure, you know, the, um, the taper. So make some measurements at different points from the, from the bottom to the top of the piston. So the top here and then part way down and then near the bottom. And that'll tell you if the cylinder has been tapered at all. Um, 
or if it's out of round at all. Now there's a tolerance for that, but uh, refer to the shop manual. Um, and again, remove all your O-rings and gaskets. One good thing to note is if you have a cracked gasket and you see any signs of coolant um, in the piston that, that was in here in this cylinder, if there's any signs of coolant in there, um, you might see the crank bearings rusted on that side. So just be aware um, if this was damaged when you took the head off, uh, you know, that, that could be a, a problem later on. Uh, next thing is the rave valves. So your rave valves uh, come off as a unit. Just take it right off and they fly off like that. Be careful. Uh, don't lose that spring. These are fairly simple. They're not really complicated. It's just, you know, uh, a top piece and a bottom bellows. And then your actual, your actual rave valve, the actual exhaust valve. Um, these things are very simple to take apart. Uh, I'd have to put my phone down, but... But uh, basically, this just unscrews, and then you can pull this right off. The wear part is this orange bellows, but you can buy these aftermarket, and they work just fine. And I've got about 20 like full rave valve sets. So if you need one, just let me know, and I can send you one. Next thing you'll probably be pulling off is the magneto. Uh, just I have the puller mounted just to show you, so you see where the bolt is. That's as far as you want to thread it. You don't want it to poke through uh, because the stator, this is in here, but the stator is mounted on the end of the crankshaft and it's bolted It's bolted to this and the crankshaft passes through. If you push the bolt too far, it'll bump into one of the stator windings and it'll cause major, major issues for you. Uh, basically your stator will be, you have to get a new one or have to get the yours rewound and it's a couple hundred bucks either way. Uh, so you just want to make sure that you don't don't do that. As far as the magneto goes, um, just make sure that your inner ring, the retaining ring, isn't cracked or or like protruding out at all, and that all the magnets are equally spaced in there and you know not delaminated at all. So so these rarely fail at all. They're pretty tough and they're pretty heavy. Um, just give it a light you know hit with an emery cloth if you got any surface rust, and coat it with a little bit of injection oil and wipe it down and. That's about it for flywheels. I mean, they're they're fairly simple. Uh, your magneto, sorry, your ignition cover um, is. There's a lot of bolts that hold this thing on. So there's three on the outside by the oil pump. There's a whole bunch inside, um, and then there's two of them, or sorry, three more on the outside by where the water pump gear is. So just make sure you have all the bolts off. Um, because if you miss one and you start reefing and hammering on this thing, trying to get it off, that can cause you big issues. Just double check everything. There's a lot of fasteners on these motors. So just double check everything that you got everything off. Um, this one does not have a trigger coil, but if you have a trigger coil, if your stator is okay, um, you know, a trigger coil rarely fails. So you can probably just leave it as it is, clean it up a little bit and ohm test it with your, with your multimeters to make sure that it tests it test out to what the shop manual says. Uh, and then you should be fine. You shouldn't have to, to do anything. If you put a new one in, you have to put Sikaflex. After you get the timing correct, you have to put Sikaflex in and torque everything down so that it doesn't move anymore. Um, the only other thing is this is where your mag seal is in the motor. So it's not in, uh, your mag seal is not on the actual crankshaft. Like right here, there's no seal that goes on there. It actually rides right here on the crank, and that's what this is. So pop this out um, and and get a new one to, to press in there uh, because you always want to replace those seals, mag and PTO, if possible. Your oil pump will be here. Uh, there's two intermediate gears. That's what the, the water pump one looks like. They have two thrust washers. Just be careful not to lose these. They are reusable if they're in good shape and basically look like that. You're good to go. You can reuse them. And then check the uh, needle bearings inside the actual intermediate gears and just make sure they're in good shape um, and not rusted or anything like that. They're pretty easy to, to check as well. So that's it with this with this mag cover. Just clean it up and, uh, and yeah, it's good to go. It's just a hunk of aluminum. So pull your, uh, or sorry, we'll get to the, we'll get to that, sorry. 
So your water pump cover, um, take this off after you take that off. Do not try to take it off before because it is bolted over here. And if you miss those bolts, you will damage this thing. Uh, this cover is just a whole bunch of fasteners. This one here is just the oil reservoir. So don't pull it out um, and, and lose it. It's got a ceiling washer on it. You can, you can leave this one on, but pull all the other fasteners off. And then there's a locating pin on the actual right there that goes into here um, and uh, essentially locates and lines this up. So it might be a little bit hard to pull off because of that locating pin um, will, will stick sometimes. Your water gear, your water pump gear basically just fits in like that. Now this one, I don't have it illustrated. It's not on here, but there's a C-clip in this little groove here. Then there's a bearing that rides right here. Then there's an oil seal right here. And then there are two water seals, like two coolant seals that run with the rear of the seals back to back. Um, so it's three seals overall. And when you pull one of these out, what you're going to want to do is take the impeller off. It just unscrews, pull the seals off, pull the bearing off, take the C-clip off and pull this bearing off as well. Polish up the shaft and make sure that the shaft is nice and uniform. There's no grooves in the shaft or anything. Try to polish those out, which is quite easy to do and if they're not too, too deep. And then get a seal kit. And, and it usually comes that if you get a buy a full engine gasket kit, the seals come for the water pump in it. And then two new bearings. Take the two bearings off, bring them to a bearing shop and match them up. Or buy them from BRP, which are just overpriced bearings from them. Um, and then get everything new on the shaft because this is a very important piece um, to make sure that you have all new seals that are in new bearings. This is vital. Um, you know, and you don't want to take any chances with that. Next thing is the reed valve. So these will just pop right out of the intake. Uh, and I'd like to keep them in until I actually tear the engine down because it stops anything from, from getting in the getting in the engine if possible. So so these are fairly simple. Um, you hold them up to the light, you know, and to see if there's any light leakage through the through the ceiling surfaces, which are which are essentially like right at the ends here. So if, make sure they're not split or chipped, and uh, you know they're they're in good shape and they're not like stuck up anywhere. They're seating nice. Um, and then the actual reed valve itself, the housing is in good shape. Make sure there's no missing screws because if there's missing screws, then chances are they've done some damage to this and or they're embedded somewhere into the lower crank or have been chewed up and spit out and done, you know, who knows what. So, so always make sure that all your, all these things are complete. Uh, if part of the, part of the reed valve is missing, like the actual pedal, that's fine because the it's just plastic. The engine will just chew it up and spit it out and without any damage. Generally, you can buy these reed pedals aftermarket, uh, Boise in Carbon Tech. You know, um, they're fairly affordable and there's a lot of good options out there and they're very easy to change. Next thing is we'll go straight to the crank. Now the crank, I did a video on the crank, but we'll go over uh, basically what you need to be aware of. The first thing I do when I get a crank um, out of a motor is I put it uh, into some diesel fuel and get it all cleaned up. And then I want to pull it out, put it on the bench. The first thing I do is I check the rods because if there's anything wrong with the rods or rod bearings, then there's no point doing anything else. You have to get the crank rebuilt or split. Uh, this crank has a bent rod. And as you can see, there's been some foreign material, um, which looks like, a uh, piston pin uh, got loose and is now stuck in the in in here. So, so this has had some damage. It's too bad though because all the bearings are in fine shape. Um, it's just this this rod and this web are damaged from from foreign material. Uh, but what I do is I check the radial play on the rods, which means the play this way. So they should be tight. There should be no clicking clacking like they this one's still very solid so there should be no play back and forth this way you can have play side to side that is allowed um, for thermal expansion 
um, there's a spec for that and you use a feeler gauge to figure out how much play you have and compare it to what's in the shot manual for what's allowed. Um, if you're over the spec or over the, over the, the allowable tolerance, then you know, you need to get either these crank webs pressed together, they weren't done enough, or these ceiling, or sorry, these thrust washers are too worn. So, so be aware of that. Check all three for the radial and the axial side to side play. Um, the next things you're going to want to do are, are, I wouldn't worry too much about these bearings, like check them definitely and be fussy, but they are these bearings right here and these two are super easy to change. Um, you don't need anything special other than a bearing puller to pull these off and press new ones on. These bearings and this seal are the important ones because you have to split the crank right apart to do anything here. So what you want to do is dunk this in diesel fuel, spin all these bearings to get all the guck out of them, uh, then pull it out and I would dry spin the bearings so with no oil in them, just the diesel fuel. I would spin them, they're going to be a little bit more noisy. Uh, spin them fast and then spin them nice and slow while, while like trying to pick the crank up. So pick like pull them and spin them at the same time. Put a little bit of load on them. Uh, then spin them just freely, like don't put any load on them. Just spin them back and forth and around and really feel for any like crunchy areas or anywhere where they get hung up and like stick because that could be uh, foreign material or corrosion on the actual balls. Um, and then grab the bearings and like try to turn them from side to like side to side like that. So try to twist them. Um, you're allowed a little tiny bit of play, but not much. That's just uh, on a cold bearing. You're allowed that because these heat up and they expand and then they basically come into tolerance uh, with the clearances. So, so if all these bearings check out, then that's really good. And if they have steel cages like, like that, um, then you're going to be in good shape most likely. So then I would put a little bit of oil in them and then spin them again. They should be like smooth as glass. They should be smooth as glass and you have a little bit of oil in them if, you've, if they've checked out. If you have bearings that have the polyamid cage like these ones, these are an excellent bearing. However, if it's an original crank in your motor that's now 20 some years old, um, you have to be aware that this polyamide material, it fatigues with age, uh, not, not with use. The, you can heat cycle this, it, it doesn't matter, but the longer that this stuff seems to sit, the more brittle it gets and it'll crack. And uh, if it cracks, it can fall out uh, and a couple of your bearing balls can run together and cause you big problems. So if it's an original crank and you have these bearings, I would advise you to budget for a crank rebuild or getting a remanufactured crank. And if the remanufactured one comes with these bearings, great. They're, they are a really good bearing. Um, if it comes with the steel cage, that is totally fine. And if you talk to your crank builder and they give you the option, um, really, it doesn't matter which one you go with. Uh, yeah, I mean, these will last. 10 plus years and not be brittle 10, 15 years without being brittle. If you run them, you know, but I myself would, I would get the steel cage bearings. Um, I've never heard of a steel cage bearing failing to the point where it takes out a motor. Um, you know, so I would just go for the steel cage bearing. They're basically the same price. The only other thing you want to check, uh, is the, the seals. Now, these rarely fail. They're very, very tough. And these inner seals see oil and gas constantly lubricating the seal surfaces. So they tend to just last a long time. Most problems are when they're installed wrong, they're slightly off kilter or they're not in the actual, you know, groove right here where the actual seal is supposed to sit. If it's just outside the groove at the bottom, especially, they can be torqued crooked and that causes your seal failures. But if everything's in nice and aligned, you generally don't have problems. Um, but to check if there is an actual split in the lower seal sealing area, you just spray some oil on here and then move this bearing or move the uh, seal back and forth and then twist it a little bit, move it back and forth again. Just keep doing that in like, you know, one sixteenth turns back and forth. And if you see a, uh, 
if you see a like line of oil when you're moving it back and forth in one little spot, like back, you know, a line of oil across there, then chances are there's a little nick in the bottom of that seal. Um, generally it will run fine with a little nick in the bottom of the seal and you might have a little bit of a hard time starting it once in a while. Uh, but you know, if the bigger, the, the bigger, the compromise in the seal, the, the harder it can be starting and, uh, it can be an issue, but, uh, but rare that these things fail. It's, it's very rare, very, very rare. Um, yeah, the only, uh, the only other thing is checking and making sure that your, your, um, rod bearings are good. And an easy way to do that is I just stand the crank up. Um, and then I spin the rods around, uh, so you can kind of hula hoop them around and, uh, and you'll tell right away. Cause if there's something for material in there, it'll, it'll make a noise or it'll catch. Uh, another thing is to slowly just pull on them, pull them and put load on them and then slowly move them around. And you can generally tell, um, if they're going to catch anywhere. But it's rare that these, that these rods fail. I mean, there's so much gas and oil mix in here. They get tons of lubrication and like even this one that's, you know, had foreign material in it. It is still, it is still really smooth. The only part that's actually, uh, that's actually making any contact is, is in the side, um, which blows my mind because there's actually a hunk stuck in there, but, but it's the the side surface that's actually eating into something. Anyway, that's about it for the crank. Um, like I said, if you're in good shape and everything's good in the middle here and all your rod stuff, all your rod bearings and clearances check out, um, then uh, you are golden. You can change these bearings. And in fact, I would change them anyway. Um, so your, your mag bearing and your P two PTO bearings and spacer, I would change those bearings anyway, just to be safe. Why not? They're, they're very easy to do. The only other thing is to check your piston pin bearing clearance. And that's easy enough. Uh, you should have absolutely no play. Once you have a, a pin and the piston bearing in there, you should have no play like this. It should be nice and tight again. So that's an easy one to check. It should be the exact same as, as the lower. Now these cases, uh, what I would do, we'll get into like some of the improvements you can make to the porting and uh, the surfaces in here. But just for now, uh, checking them over. First thing I would do is wipe everything down and, and get it as clean as possible. Um, the biggest hit, telltale sign if you've had issues, it's just to check where the crank webs run. And if there's any huge gouges of material out of here or any foreign material pushed in to the aluminum or any cracks, then you know, you've got, you've got an issue. One thing on this mag side, you're going to want to look at is there's a little hole at the bottom. That hole right there is to scavenge, um, fuel and oil into this mag side and lubricate all the bearings and, uh, and gears in here. So just make sure that Put a little pipe cleaner in there and make sure that that hole is free. So check each area where the crank throw is. Make sure, uh, like I said, no cracks, no for material being pushed in there. Nothing, no big huge, you know, gouges being scraped out from for material or, or, you know, like a catastrophic failure. Check all three and then go to the bearing sealing surfaces and make sure like you, there might be a little bit of rust here and there. You can take an emery cloth and, and clean that up with a bit of oil. Um, once you have the crank and everything out of here, I would coat this, all these surfaces here with oil and, and here and here as well, because they're steel and um, they will rust. So just make sure that that's done on both sides of the crank. So you've got, or both sides of the case. So you've got all those surfaces as well that you should put lubricants on. So the next thing is flip her over and then look for any cracks, especially in this area where my fingers are here. So all along here, it's more tenants. It's got the highest tendency to crack in these areas right at the bottom. Um, you know, and if everything looks good, then, then that's great. These don't fail too much unless you like throw a rod or have some other catastrophic failure. Um, look at the water pump housing. If there's any rust on these surfaces, 
clean it up with some emery cloth um, or steel wool and then throw a coat of oil on here as well. And that goes for this surface here. That's the other part of the, the water pump surface. So just clean everything up. You're going to have, you're probably going to have some sealing material on here. Uh, so just make sure that's all cleaned up. Scrape it off with a plastic paint scraper and uh, a, like a not too stiff wire brush will take it off. Um, and then you can go over it with some very fine emery cloth or steel wool uh, to clean this right up. Do this on your gasket surfaces as well. On the um, on the uh, upper case half, same thing. Just check for gouges, uh, especially this part here where the rod passes through. Make sure there's nothing chipped off here or or around here, so everything's nice and all the material's still there. Uh, on all three, again, check all your bearing surfaces and clean them up and lubricate them as needed. Check your oil injectors. Uh, if you see anything like, like these little openings, if they've been bashed in, in anywhere, you're going to have to change that out if you want to keep your oil injection. Uh, if you don't, you can get rid of these and, and drill and tap the holes and fill them. And another thing to check because you'll do all this and then you'll put the case away and, and then when you come in to put the engine back together again, you might notice that you've got broken bolt, broken bolt. Uh, for these, these are not, these are pretty forgiving because they're drilled all the way, like they're tapped all the way through. So you can, you know, try an easy out here or you can drill this right out and then tap it one size bigger all the way around. I've done that and it's totally fine, works great. Um, so these are fairly forgiving, but make sure you check them because you might have to deal with, um, uh, you know, like broken bolts and whatnot. To stop this, I usually swap out the self-tapping bolts that are, that are originally in here with some nice hex head bolts and then use some anti-seize uh, or never seize on, on them. And that solves that problem. You never have an issue taking anything out again. So that is pretty much it for, for things to look for in the motor. Um, we will get into improvements that you can make to the, uh, to the case and somewhat to the cylinders to uh, basically, you know, improve the efficiency of the motor and to give you a little bit more performance um, and, you know, a little bit more torque and horsepower in the mid to top end. Um, without sacrificing the low end of these motors because you don't want to take too much of the low end away, uh, the low end power and torque of these motors just because of, you know, it, it does hurt their trailability and, you know, your general driving general driving characteristics. Uh, so anyway, we will end the video there. And um, if you have any questions about any of this, please let me know. I will do my best to answer anything and I went over this fairly quickly even though it's been like a 40 minute video um if there's something I didn't cover that you really want to know about by all means hit me up I will do another video um totally fine I have no problems with that so yeah the next video yeah I'll talk about the improvements you can make and uh and I didn't get into any pistons yet I I assume that you're probably going to get new pistons and rings anyway so I don't really care about, about um, you know, looking at the pistons other than to see if there's been any catastrophic failure. And I guess I can kind of go over that now is when you take the piston out, it should look relatively like this. There should not be any chunks missing. There should not be bits of ring missing. Um, and each piston should still have its locating pin. So one there, and then there's one, I believe it's, oops, on this side. Where is it? There it is. So there should be a locating pin. You should, you should still see the locating pins in the pistons. Um, if those are missing, then they're probably stuck somewhere in the crank. Uh, and just be sure, you know, and the head of the piston should look fairly normal. Or the surface of the piston should look normal other than you're probably going to see like black with some shiny marks where the where the ports are and that's a good sign 
um, if you had coolant leak, you'll see this will probably be pretty clean and washed off. Um, so just be aware of that. But uh, like I said, I wouldn't get too fussy about measuring pistons and making sure the ring tolerances and, and play are okay. Basically, I'm going to take the piston out and shoot it in the garbage because we'll be getting new ones anyway. Why not? They're, they're fairly cheap for a set of cast pistons. And if you want to go forge, they're about four or 500 bucks. But anyway, um, yeah. So until next time, um, have a great day and hope everybody's keeping well.